Hi, and welcome back to Hat Chat. Um, today we're going to look at some vintage hats. Uh, we're going deeper into that dig of box seven. If you've been following me, you know that I'm acquiring. Um, I'm on my way to uh, another archive of a thousand vintage hats. These have been um, stored previously in a fashion archive in Quebec, and they um, are from various eras, uh, various workmanship, various labels. So digging through box seven, and it takes a while. Imagine packing a hundred hats into a big cardboard box and shipping them off. That's what's been done. But um, these hats are such well-made pieces that um, they're easy to restore. So some of them might need a little repair. Some of them might need some steaming and blocking, but they're they're coming along. And as I say, this past week, I've dug a little deeper and I've come across some really wonderful black hats. As the director of the Mobile Millinery Museum, um, we've been traveling for 20 years now, showing retrospective millinery fashion shows and placing each hat in social context, telling stories about them, having fun with them, uh, watching them being modeled. Unfortunately, of course, now that we're um, dealing with COVID, we can't do that at the moment. So that's why I'm sharing um, kind of behind the scenes what at the museum what we're up to. I have said over the years, now imagine when we do these shows, we show hats from the Victorian era through the different fashion decades to the 20th century, and we show a variety of color, workmanship, fabrication, style. Um, but I've often said over the years that the black hats excite me so much that I'd really love to do fashion shows sometime that were solely of black hats. And actually we started doing that a few years ago. We responded to some requests for shows uh, around the Halloween theme. And so we've done another pre a number of presentations at what are called witches teas, and that's a lot of fun. So uh, these hats may go into that, that particular sub collection. But in the meantime, I wanna show you what I've come across. Here's a basic black uh, beaver felt hat from the 1930s, very basic, beautifully shaped with the round um, crown at the back, this deep asymmetric folded up brim. And you can see that it's very simply trimmed with a black ostrich feather. We did talk about feathers in previous episodes and we know that ostrich feathers uh, using them in fashion does not harm the bird. Um, plucking the feathers d does no harm to the bird itself. So. Setting that aside, I want to show you what else I've found on the black theme. Again, another black felt. This, these felts uh, that we're looking at today are high quality felts. They uh, originate from beaver pelts. We know, and actually uh, hat makers and historians have known for eons, that beaver pelt lends itself most nicely to the felting process. Uh, beaver felt hats are your highest quality of felt hats. Uh, you want to stay away from wool felt if you if you want a hat that um, will stand the test of time. Rabbit pelt, that's sort of a medium, medium quality. But anyway, getting back to this piece, there's so much going on in this hat. I, th I think it's, a, it's quite a little dull. This um, actually is from the 1940s. Um, there's a bit of everything on here. The veiling is quite interesting, um, very um, fishnetty, and it has banded the hat and also provided a little a little bit of a face covering at the front um, that can look very dramatic um, you know as we travel around and do these shows we talk to a lot of women who wore these fashion hats back in the day we do a lot of presentations to seniors groups and we've heard some interesting stories one woman told me that um, she was wearing a very fashionable, um, full veiled hat, a veil that came to her chin. She went out to dinner with a gentleman and this was in summer. She dined at a restaurant in Montreal and she remembered, of course, during dinner to lift the veil. Um, some ladies actually have told me that sometimes they got so used to wearing veiled hats that they forgot to lift the veil. One lady told me that she realized what she had done when she tried to put a fork full of food in her mouth. Kind of embarrassing. There aren't too many sad hat stories that we come across, but that's kind of one of them. This is even this is even worse. This woman, you know, she dined, then she replaced the veil. She looked so elegant. She left the restaurant. Uh, it was in summer. The street lights were on, and she was suddenly swarmed with June bugs. That can can you imagine them just you know globbing on to this veil and ooh, what a horrible situation. Anyway, 
didn't happen to this hat and we're in love with this little deer. This has, many ha hats have um, an open crown. This has a sort of a crescent shaped semi open crown with um, this really cool um, gold mesh. Another little feature of this hat, I'm hoping the camera picks this up, is um, some ruffling of black satin. So this um, Milner's been very creative. I'm going to tell you not a lot about this particular Milner. I noticed that the label says Lady Letty, size 22. Well, the size 22 tells us that, um, well, you know, that that's an older hat. Um, by the 1960s, when a lot of ladies were buying their hats for themselves, they weren't having them custom made. Um, they were buying them in department stores. You didn't see hat sizes on labels. Um, of course, if you were having your hat custom made, not only would you know the size, your head size, but your milliner would keep a record of that too. But the label itself says Lady Letty. Um, we don't know who this milliner is. I've tried to do some research, or research on her. Perhaps her name was Letitia. Le, uh, Letty is um, a, sh a nickname for Letitia. Or maybe she took her inspiration from an old movie from the 20s. I think it was called The Moran of Lady um, Letty. It was a silent film. Anyway, so these hats, you know, they've got some secrets. They've got some mystery. And it's it's fun to kind of, kind of figure out what they're all about. Now this next one is a classic style. This is a pillbox. And I'm sure you all know this classic style. It's been done again and again in different... Different decades with different variations, different workmanship, that sort of thing. Uh, I like this. It's very deep. It's a simple buckram um, form, and it's covered with organdy, black organdy, with five um, giant self-fabric roses. This would have looked stunning on a blonde. This would have... Now, you want to think, uh, realize that in the 60s, well, in every era anyway, hats would have to... Um, they'd have to complement the silhouette of what you were wearing. So each decade has its sort of iconic silhouette. And when the, we think of the late 60s, we think of the um, miniskirt silhouette. And the rule of thumb in millinery then was that the shorter the skirt, the higher the crown of the hat would be. So you can just imagine how elegant this hat would have been with a little mini dress. There you go. Now, um, I'm also excited to show you this raffia hat. So as you can see, just about any um, material can be used to, to create a hat. This has a very high crown. This too is from the late 60s. Uh, the raffia straw is lovely and light. Um, I love the contrast between the texture of the straw and this wide grosgrain band. Uh, and it's got a bow. And what's really cool is this is just as fresh as a daisy and could easily be worn today. I think it's I think it's pretty cool. Okay, of course, I think a lot of hats are pretty cool. And speaking of cool, this next one, uh, another variation on the pillbox. This one you can see has, I hope you can see, the, um, the felt has been folded. So, you know, we get this sort of three-tiered effect. It is long nap beaver felt. Uh, we know, of course, um, well, I don't know if everybody knows, but um, beaver, of course, was highly prized, and it, the search for beaver pelt helped open up our own continent. Uh, historians tell us that King Charles I of England was beheaded in a hat made from Canadian beaver. Uh, the next day, styles, hat styles for men changed the very next day. But it's interesting that historians made a point of, um, of telling us that this was you know, his hat was made from Canadian beaver, so it was very highly prized, but it also tells me that there is a hat for every single occasion. Imagine that. Um, what's fun, there's a lot of fun things about this pillbox, which you might think is rather a simple style, but there's so much you can do with it. Now, what I love about this is the crown, rather than being, um, this hat being completely circular, the crown has a teardrop shape. And if you if you're searching for the center back, which is where you're, you know, usually the label is there or there's a center back seam if you're trying to figure out how the hat is to be worn, we realize that the dip or the point of the, um, of the teardrop is to be worn tilted off to this side. And you can see what that, what that does for the wearer. 
and again we got this little diamond dot veiling which is I don't know just so much fun now uh, the biggest um, excitement factor for me about this hat is the label and I'm pretty sure that I'm not going to be able to show you that well maybe I'll um, no I don't think so but it's uh, Yvette Briand now Yvette Briand some historians fashion historians credit her as being Canada's um, premier millinery designer uh, for a lot of reasons um, and she actually she started making hats when she was 12 um, she opened her shop in the 30s I'm not sure if it was 1933 1936 but um, yeah and and she remained in business this hat was uh, created in the 60s now um, we have a fair number of hats uh, by Yvette Briand and perhaps I'll do um, a video some point showing that entire collection. Um, the McCord um, Museum in Montreal has a really good profile on her if you're interested in finding out more about her career. Um, I, I would recommend that, that you go there. Now the next hat I'm going to show you was not part of the um, box number seven collection, but I did want to show it along with um, the Yvette Briand because this too is an Yvette Briand. This is, uh, this came earlier in, a, in another um, batch and this one is very, very early. The label, which I know you're going to have trouble seeing, is a much earlier label and uh, very likely this had this um, might have been from the late 1930s. Now this style is called cartwheel uh, and of course it, it's pretty um, easy to tell how it gets its name. This very very shallow crown. That was a popular style in the 1930s and if you're worried about these blowing away of course uh, you needn't worry. Most milliners put in a little chignon strap that would sit at the back under your hair and that would be secured. And You could further secure this with a hat pin there's some fun things about this hat as well. If you look very carefully, um, I don't think you'll see it in this, but I mean, generally speaking, when you're finding or purchasing or considering purchasing vintage hats or, or trying to date them or trying to understand them, take a very close look. You may find um, some little remnants of thread where a trim has been, um, has been lost. It originally uh, probably was uh, secured to the hat and maybe someone decided to change the style or use the feather for something else. I can just picture a beautiful knife pleat feather, um, you know, adding a little more interest to this hat. Um, the workmanship, the fabrication, you may wonder um, why someone would spend a lot of money on uh, having a custom hat made when there were a lot of knockoffs and you could get a similar effect at a, at a cheaper price. But understand that this hat would have been made um, from a bale of straw and it would have been hand sewn in concentric circles from the center crown. But then what this Milner has, uh, has done is further done handwork to pinch these little um, areas together. And so it gives it a really wonderful textured look. Should we finish on that hat? I th well, there's one more. The next one in, in the same batch, digging deeper, um, was this black mink. Now some of you I know collect, um, collect fur hats. There's, there's a lot of reasons to collect fur hats. Um, for warmth, of course, particularly living in Canada. Um, for the beauty, for, you know, for the history, etc. Some people collect them um, to um, use them to make teddy bears and other crafts like that, which, which is great. Uh, mink, of course, uh, was known to be the most, um, the warmest of the fashion furs. And, um, of course, it was always very, very chic. I'm going to say a lot more on mink in an, in an upcoming episode because there's so much to say about mink and there's such a variety of colors um, that I think it's, um, it, it's worth looking at, um, looking at them on their own. So there is uh, today's, the end of today's video. I hope you're having a happy time. And I want you to know I'm looking forward to another shipment of hats, but we haven't gotten to the bottom of this one yet. Have a great week. Bye.